Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Alejandra Barraza. I am the president of High Scope Educational Research Foundation. And we wanna welcome you to our very last round table for the impact of agency on ch children's lives long-term. This is part of the segregation by experience, agency, racism, and learning in the early grades book study that we've held for the last couple of months. You can actually purchase the book at the center of Highscope's latest roundtable series at our highscope.org store. It is now an honor to welcome Segregation by Experience author Jennifer Keyes Adair. She is the Associate Professor of Curriculum and Instruction and the Director of the Agency and Young Children Research Collective at the University of Texas at Austin. She is a cultural anthropologist and former preschool teacher who works with parents, teachers, administrators, and young children to challenge white-centered institutions and racist scientific ideas that too often govern early childhood education. Welcome, Dr. Adair. Thank you, um, Dr. Barasa. And I'm going to be, I have the privilege of introducing our amazing panel today. Um, and before I do that, I think on behalf of um, Dr. Colgrove and myself as the authors of Segregation by Experience, we want to offer our deep appreciation to the entire High Scope team for doing this book club and um, engaging with our work, engaging what we learned from the children and teachers, some of whom are here today as part of our panel. I'm just so grateful for taking this work seriously, for your leadership in early childhood education nationally and internationally. Um, and just for really centering young children um, in your collective work. We're just really grateful to be part, to have been part of this um, book series. So um, we have a number of amazing people as part of this panel. Um, Dr. Kiyomi Sanchez Suzuki Colgrove is an associate professor of bilingual and early childhood education at Texas State University. Um, Natasha Jones, is um, a, has been a teacher. She is Miss Bailey in the Segregation by Experience book. She is an incredible young scholar and um, is a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Austin in early childhood education. She will make an incredible researcher and teacher educator and I just can't wait for her to be unleashed on all of the, on, on so many teachers and, and how, what she'll do um, in the rest of her career. Um, I also want to introduce um, Jeremiah and Dina and Stacy, who are three of the amazing students in Miss Bailey's class. Each of them have many stories under different names, but they have many stories in the book and they're also part of the epilogue, which we're centering today in our discussion. Just wanna thank Jeremiah and Stacy and Dina. It's unusual to have so many people who are research participants also be able to share um, their own voices and participate. And I'm very, very grateful. They're missing a little bit of school, but I think it'll be worth it um, we're going to start today by having a few questions um, to Natasha about her experience participating, uh, what it's like to be the subject of a book. I've never been the subject of a book. I don't know if anyone else has ever been, um, but she'll share some of her experiences. And then um, we'll move to the three students who are with us. And we have a couple of film clips to show all of you and some questions for them. Um, and then the last part of today, we'd really like to open it up for question and answer. So please don't hesitate or wait till the end to put your questions um, in the Q&A box. Please do it as soon as you have questions and we'll fill up the rest of the time today. Um, Kiyomi and I can ask each other questions, but we'd much rather hear your questions and try to answer as much as we can. Or you can have questions for um, Natasha or Jeremiah or Stacy or Dina, and we can collectively 
um, answer them. Thank you again for uh, for being here, and I'll turn it over to Kiyomi, who's going to ask some questions of Natasha. Um, buenas tardes. So over here in Texas is afternoon. So buenas tardes um, for and thank you for coming um, and having us and having the interest for the book. So today I would like to ask actually ask Natasha some questions um, that I think they can kind of bring us a, a, into reflection as we got into the last part of the book study. So having the opportunity to go through every chapter and today we're in the epilogue and kind of like a ending and reflecting and thinking about everything that we did together. I have the privilege to actually be with Natasha for like a year and a half, um, collecting data, spending endless days with her and her students that are here today with us. So I appreciate their time. Um, and the first thing we want to ask Natasha is, what did you learn in this process of participating in the study? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's good to be here. And I love how everyone is introducing themselves in the chat and saying where they're from. That's really neat to know. Um, so what did I learn? I learned a whole lot of things, but I will stick to a couple of them. Um, the main thing is, you know, there's always this phrase that we hear, like sometimes, um, you know, being a lifelong learner, like what does it mean to be a lifelong learner? And sometimes we, we ask that of our children and we want them to be lifelong learners. And I feel like in this project, uh, participating in this was, was not a comfortable thing at first. It was really scary, to be honest, <laughs> to begin with, you know. I didn't fully understand what it was uh, to, uh, at the beginning, other than it was research at the service of, you know, bettering the experiences of young children. And that's a big selling point. Um, so my colleague and I jumped in and, you know, agreed to do this. And um, there were several times where I felt like, am I doing the right thing? Are we doing the right thing? Is this what we're looking for? But at the end of the day, um, growth happens in very uncomfortable spaces sometimes like you know stepping out of the, your comfort zone is usually usually can be a really sweet spot to do things differently to to release control to um to just be more open to things that we don't we might know but we need to perfect and we need to um uh, be better at, um, and that's what this project did for me, uh, being able to, to learn so much, not just from outside resources and books and curriculum, but like actually be more present with who is in the room with you, what do they know, what are they interested in, what are they, uh, what are they really good at that you might not be paying enough attention to, um, so that was the definitely worth, you know, the, the some of the discomfort of, you know, being filmed and uh, and 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 but also learning, learning with with researchers, you know, from right here in Austin, from UT, and learning with colleagues um, and and trying out different things and sometimes failing and then trying again, but also finding joy, finding joy in the things that we do when we teach and when we're with, with our students um, who also are the greatest source of like knowledge. And, and, and I learned a lot from the children. So I, I mean, you guys probably have get to know Natasha throughout reading the book. Um, but I, as I spend so much time in her class, I think that learning it's probably true to 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 you because it's always this idea of a lot of reflection and this humble thinking about your role as a teacher. So um, it's it's kind of like a segue to the next one, which is what did you learn from the children? Oh. Uh... Children are brilliant <laughs> and we don't spend enough time uh, really paying attention to what they're, they're, they're doing, what they're interested in, how they interact, how they, what kind of community members they are, what they're bringing, like the knowledges, the multiple knowledges that they bring with them. Um, and 
you know, as as educators, we often have so much that we have to cover and so many um, skills that, you know, we, you know, we're the children and us teachers are accountable for and and sometimes um, that can be a uh, like an obstacle to really, really getting to know what the children know, what they're capable of, what they're interested in. Um, and with this uh, um, video cute ethnography, it was wonderful because not only I got to spend my days with my students, but also I got to go back and look at footage and, and look at things that had happened that I might not have noticed because you know in a classroom with 22 students there's a, in any given day there's all sorts of things happening all sorts of interactions all sorts of of, of knowledge and questions and, and 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 problem solving that they, they they go through and so getting to see see um the video footage from the research um was just beautiful uh, to see how when we give children time and space to do things they're able to like show you all these beautiful things and, and enact things help each other out take care of their space take care of each other um, um have arguments go through emotions solve those problems in a way that makes sense to them and that might be not the way that i would solve them but it's it's wonderful though it's almost like adding a repertoire of things that we can do ways that we can en engage with one another mm -hmm. and um, and hearing their voices and hearing their laughter and hearing them um, being curious about things and having time to explore what are those things and how do we figure this out and what happens if it doesn't work so who do I go to when I when I don't know how to do this or how to access this how can I help out my friend who needs this or that um, so I learned that children are brilliant, they're empathetic, and they take care of each other when we let them. They are, um, they want to know more. And sometimes, you know, when we try to control them too much, then that kind of shuts it down. And um, it's really unfortunate. And also, in watching the footage, I also learned things about myself, about things that, you know, are that I do, and you know, you talked about being reflective. Um, definitely, I had to be very reflective in watching this footage, but seeing the things that I do that allows young children to do the things that they are interested in doing and sustains their attention and drives their learning and, and also reflect on the things that I do, that I did, or that sometimes I still do, that interrupts it and that, um, that that limits what they can do and how they can be and how they can be good community members and and wonderful learners you know uh, natasha one of the things that i do remember is like um when we were showing back the film and you were like always like a little hmm because it's nerve-wracking to see yourself teaching i mean anyone who have to done any type of videotaping of the self and then um, I remember when you realized that, like, uh, I, I got to see all the things from the children. So even as like, it wasn't your focus about you, it was more about actually how children were learning and the type of things that we're doing. So that, um, I remember that as being as kind of like a, like a aha moment and how we think about how the videos actually allow for that reflection in that, those moments. Mm -hmm. um, that they're so hard when we're teaching. And like you said, we have so many students to actually have those type of opportunities. Um, so throughout the, the book study, um, there is, and also because of all the people we're interviewing, so we have the teachers and administrators. So what are some messages you want teachers and administrators to take with them, uh, like after the reading the book and seeing um, your classroom and your students? I guess in line with what I learned um, about myself as an educator, um, realizing that oftentimes the way we make sense of uh, when we try to get to what children know and what they need to know and what they're capable of doing, the measures that we use can be very myopic, myopic and limiting and don't do justice to how complex and sophisticated children's um, knowledges and ways of being can be and just knowing that yes we live in an age of accountability but accountability sometimes um 
can limit what we see. And when we only focus on like numerical data and which I know that we need to be able to, um, well, in, in the systems as we exist that, but also understanding that it's, it's only just a tiny sliver of what children can do and are capable of. And that was like just a lesson for myself um, in, in, in going through this and in, in participating in this study and getting to watch footage and, um, and reflect on it um, and still reflecting on it, you know, many years after is that the measures that we use do not do justice to not only what the children know, but also what their families know. And, and it's, uh, and it, it can be really hard for children, you know, especially if, you, if you're a child who, who, you know, have different culture or cultural experiences and have different familial uh, values than what is expected at school to feel successful and empowered if we're only going to pay attention to this tiny little thing and to this number instead of seeing the full pictures of capabilities and of, um, of, of ways they can like, build on what they already know and that they bring um, with them to the classroom that they need to have time to enact, to engage, to talk, to make mistakes, to, to, um, to just try out things, to move, to, to find joy in learning. You know, there's so much we want them to know. And, and then we think that sometimes, you know, the one way to get to all of it is to have like very controlled days, you know, with very specific goals that we have to achieve. Um, and while that's important, sometimes it just uh, shuts us off from other beautiful, wonderful, sophisticated, rigorous learning that could be happening. Um, and I'm not just talking about academic learning, but also learning of how to be, how to be, a, 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 you know, a community member, citizen of the, the classroom and the school and the world and, and take care of our environment that, and so those are not things that are always included in our standards and in our, um, in the things that we want children to achieve. Sorry, that was a long winded answer. <laughs> No, but I, I just want to add that I also think about the sense of community that you created and how that sense of community that I was so unique and special to your classroom allowed children to show those capabilities. And then for you to think, to think about how limiting the way we think about um, assessment actually comes to be. So I feel like that is so helpful um, to think about. And because we do this work and we are in teacher preparation, right? That's that's what I do, Jen, uh, you too, and IUT. So do you have any message, especially for in terms of teacher preparation to um, you wish they know before they actually go into the classroom from pre-service teachers right now, but going into classrooms and teaching? I. I feel like, you know, when we enter classroom spaces, you know, as educators, we feel like we have to have like this very specific agendas and, 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 and how each minute of the day is going to be employed and for what purpose and what, what goal and what is the outcome going to be. And what we sometimes don't have the, the time and space and agency as teachers to do is to just watch and listen, <laughs> watch and listen, not to evaluate or assess the children, but just to pay attention to who are these children? What do they know? What are they interested in? How are they interacting with one another? What are they, what are their different ways of being? What are, um, so just like, just watching and listening um, with like genuine interest and curiosity um, because they are like, as a teacher, you spend a whole year with, you know, this community and you spend hours and hours together and sometimes um, you end up not knowing them well enough if you don't do that. And that is really hard to, um, 
to do and it's not really enjoyable to spend that much time when you only are concerned with i'm going to teach you this and this and this and this and this but it has to be it has to be communal it has to be an exchange it has to be things there's so many things that every year i learn from you know students their families um that um that you know make me a lifelong learner too like you know mm -hmm. that the lifelong learner because um we have things to teach children but they also have things to teach us um and just kind of like really it's a simple simple advice but just listen and and learn and, and pay attention and just enjoy without any specific agenda but just being able to to take your students seriously and learn from what they're excited about what they're good at what they they want to know more about um and then build on that when we when we engage like with different you know subject or curriculum like building on what what it is that they they already know and they're interested in um and it makes it so much more enjoyable for everyone, adults and children. So I want to tell you that a lot of the students in my class and gen class, especially the undergraduates, are reading the book. And I have to say, as future teachers are always looking up to you, they have like a fascination with you um, because of that, that observation, that pausing, that reflection. So I just wanted to tell you because many of the the advice, what kind of like a, what you want people to live with is actually things that are, are, are happening. And I feel like a, through conversations with future teachers is something that it's, it's actually going on. So thank you so much, Natasha, for um, coming in and in, in talking to us. And now I would like Jen to show uh, some of the children videos. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to show a couple of clips from that are referenced in the book. The first one is actually a clip we showed in the very first um, roundtable back, I think it was September or October. Um, but I'm going to show it to you again, and I want you in the chat to share um, if you could describe what you're seeing. Um, in one word, what is the word that you would use? This scene um, takes place relatively early in the year. There's a lot um, in the book about the volcano project. And this is the incident that really is towards the beginning of that project where um, a student, Mary, is really excited about volcanoes, goes home for the weekend and comes back with this amazing volcano model. And again, Miss Bailey or Miss Jones is so, I just, I just think it's incredible that she doesn't make the kids wait. They're all excited when Mary walks, walks in with this volcano model and instead of making them wait, um, they get to do it right then. And so this is a clip of that. So be thinking about what, what is one word you would use to describe this? And then I'll have a more specific question for the second video. water i think we need like this much water yeah oh yes that would be like good it has a lot of water but i need more room it's enzo oh 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 you weren't supposed to pour all of it the baking soda the baking soda put the baking baking soda Okay, what's your one word? How would you describe 
um, what was happening in the, this volcano video. Excitement, teamwork, engaged, definitely joy, collaboration, teamwork, fun, togetherness, yeah, interactive, curiosity, eager, communication. Yeah, these are great conversations, learning from each other, two-way communication, lots of laughter, lots of enjoyment, patience. <laughs> yeah, a lot of excitement. Um, that I think it's really important to think about. I mean, this, the whole point of this book is, is um, the importance of children using their agency to learn, especially at school and how their agency is often thwarted or stopped or cut off or denied for a variety of reasons. Um, but these things that you see are, the, are what happens when we allow them to use their agency. All of these kinds of words, I think we see more and more of the words you're putting in the chat when children are able to use their agency at school. And part of the point of this book is you'll see this stuff if you let them use their agency. If you don't, this stuff is much harder to come by. I think as a lot of you know, and all of you are lucky to benefit from the high scope curriculum, which really promotes children using their agency and um, being able to have influence and make decisions about how they learn and what they learn. All right, let's do the second one. This time, I want you to think about what kinds of capabilities you see children demonstrating. Um, what kinds of things do they demonstrate that they know? What kinds of things do they demonstrate that they're good at? Um, and then we'll ask the Dina and Jeremiah and Stacy. after we show this video, we'll ask you to um, turn your cameras on and um, just share what you remember from this time. Um, everyone is now juniors. And so this is back when they were in first grade. So we're asking a lot to ask them to <laughs> remember what it was like. Um, and um, so let's let's watch the second one and, and then I'll have you share in the chat what capabilities you saw children demonstrating and um, we'll hear from the students what they remember from being part of this huge study. All right, here's our second one. This one, um, I should say, happened on a, um, a regular day of school and they were learning about human body and how humans are different than other animals and basically for about two hours um, the students in both first grade classrooms Miss Bailey's classroom and her partner's classroom they got to go back and forth they got to there was a nurse who had a blood pressure cuff there was a doctor with a um, a reflex hammer, which is what you're going to see. There were puzzles of bodies, there were animal bones, there was all kinds of things, and the kids just got to go around um, and experiment and engage with all of these different things about the body and about what it means to be a human or another type of animal. So you're going to see some kids that got really into the reflex hammer and how it works. <clears throat> Okay. 
All right. Um, so what did you, what kind of capabilities did you see them demonstrating? And while you're putting that, while you're putting that in the, in the chat, I'll go ahead and um, bring up our, our students. All right. Dina and Jeremiah and Stacy, you want to turn your cameras on? <laughs> Great. Okay. So, um, what do you remember from being a student back then, being studied? What do you remember about that experience? Stacy, you want to go first? Okay. You just have to unmute. I forgot. I'm sorry. I know. Um, but uh, I, re I, my memory is very bad. But I do remember the cameras being there, and I, I remember the, the volcano. I remember seeing one of the kids that weren't like watching, the volcano project I was seeing. I remember looking at them, and I was like a little sad because they weren't looking at my, um, at, at my volcano. I, and I remember like I still think about that to this day, and I feel like it was like a very positive experience, like learning and like being very hands on. And having that like independence, I feel like thanks to that experiment, that's what made me like a very independent person. But, yeah. Jeremiah, thanks, Stacy. Jeremiah or Dina, do you want to go next? What do you remember? Um, for me personally, I don't, I don't really remember much. I like remember little bits like in stories, but I remember the volcano. And also remember, like Miss Jones, she read us um, Esperanza Rising. Like that's like that's like stuck in my head, like that book. And yeah, it's just like little stories I like I can remember. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dina. Jeremiah, what do you remember? I do not remember the volcano because I was actually the student who was doing their own little thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do remember the story. I remember her reading all the time. And I remember it was always the best because we would always run and try to go to, try to get a, a good spot to like listen and everyone would always fight over the pillows. It was, it was really fun. Uh, I don't really remember the cameras, but I always just remember like the class. Like if I, I try to think about it really hard and I just don't remember the cameras at all. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's, it's really good to just not remember it, I guess. Thanks, Jeremiah. Um, when you, how do you think, well, let me say this. When we showed this video, when we show this video, some of the questions that we get are, if students had this much agency or this much freedom in the class and you had an amazing year with, with Ms. Jones, what happened when you went to other grades? Like, did it make it harder for you to adjust to grades that were really strict or teachers that were really strict? Um, so I'm just wondering what you think, like, how did that year with Miss Jones, like the way she was a teacher, how do you think it impacted you overall? Stacy, you want to start? How did it impact you, do you think? Um, well, I noticed that, like, whenever I moved classes or, like, whenever I moved schools, I noticed the difference in, like, the way the teachers, like, interacted with their students. I noticed that, like, they would talk to some students very differently and they would get very impatient. Um, and this isn't, this isn't just like at UT, this is like at other schools that I've gone to in elementary. Um, but yeah, I feel like learning, the, like 
being in that very like interactive um, atmosphere, it made me like want to be hands on with everything and jump in everything. But I feel like as I got older and, you know, as I like we went into different grades, I feel like I didn't have that like liberty. So it kind of just held me back a little and made me bored. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. What about you, Dina? Um, I think like one thing that I remember like that I liked most about the classroom was that like you were kind of friends with everybody, like no matter like the race or like you it's like not trying to make it a race thing, but it's like you really couldn't see their color. But like once I left UT and went to like other schools, I realized like it was harder to like, I just couldn't make friends as easily. Mm-hmm. And I like, I think that Miss Jones was like a big part of that. Cause like she would put us in our seats, like specifically, like we didn't pick those, but like they weren't bad seats. Like everybody that I sat around, like I, I liked. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Do you think there was certain things that Miss Jones did that made it like that? That was different from what other teachers did? Like, why do you think everyone got along so well? I don't know that seating chart it was just it was just a it was really good <laughs> <laughs> the key is the know. seating chart <laughs> yes I don't, it's it's like weird to explain it's like you never sat around somebody you didn't want to mm. at least i don't i don't remember ever having like a bad seating like a bad spot in that class but it's like mm. we didn't sit down for long either but like you know yeah you were moving around a lot Jeremiah, what about you? How did that, how do you think that impacted you your first grade year being in her class? Uh, um, my first grade year, I was only there for UT for that year. And then I had moved to Del Valley and I've been here ever since. And it's very different. Um, not like in a bad way, but it is different. Um, there is less hands-on things um, and I believe that uh, Stacy was right. Like it just built like uh, a certain way of like controlling things, and then people just like aren't always doing the same thing as you, and so it's very different. It was it was a very fun time though. Uh, there were always good memories. Never never a dull one. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha, is there anything they're making you think about, or anything you want to ask? Well, first, I, you know, when Dina was saying that how difficult it is to make friends, like I, when I remember Dina in first grade, it's just like such a, like a sociable, outgoing person who was friends with everyone and took care of, I remember like you even like taking care of me when I forgot things like in my water bottle and things like that. And just like very observant and present. So I, I, it's really hard for me to hear that you found it difficult to make friends later on. Um, I can't reconcile these two things. And um, each and every one of you, like I have very specific memories of the things that you like to do and you wanted to do, the people you wanted to, you know, interact with and the things that you got excited about. Um, And it's really, it's very um, sometimes, I don't know what the word is. Um, it, it's great to see, like, I can see all three of you now are, you know, just as probably just as brilliant as you were when you're in first grade. And I really do hope that you continue to trust all of the, the, the knowledge and the, that you have and, and feel empowered to do whatever it is that you want to do because you can do anything you want to do, uh, even the hard things. Um, I want you to remember that because if you could do all these things when you were six or seven, I can only imagine <laughs> what you can achieve now. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Natasha. Um, So uh, we have a little clip from when we interviewed you for the epilogue. Um, The epilogue in the book is almost word for word what everyone said, because what they said was so brilliant. There wasn't really the need for us to write about it. 
we just wanted to share with you what they said. So um, Kiyomi's prepared a little clip from that um, epilogue that she's going to share. And then we have, um, she'll ask a question and I'll ask a question to, to the students and then we'll um, open it up for Q&A. Um, Kiyomi? Okay. So here is the film. Can you guys see it? Okay. If you had to do, if you had to say what a good learner is, like, what does it mean to be a good learner? Um, okay. Um, the one that they just, I don't know. Um, I feel like being a good learner is if you're able to understand and comprehend what you're learning with ease. Yeah. Okay. What do you think? Said, said what I said. <laughs> what? It was like kind of similar. I just said like a good listener, somebody who could learn easily and who can understand different methods of learning. It. Okay. Okay. What else? Do you patient. Think? Patient. patient. Yeah. Because if you're a pre-K teacher, you have to be patient with the kids. Yes. So if they're like, obviously they're not going to focus on the first. Time. That's true. <laughs> also, somebody who's open to learn because if you're not open, then there's no point. Yeah. What? What do you mean? There's no point of what? Like there's like there's no point on learning something if you're not gonna try. Mm. Yeah. Try what? Like try to learn, like try to listen and take in what they're saying. What else? What else do you think is a good like? How do you know somebody's a pretty good learner? Like, like if they learn. concentrate on topic and if they can understand different ways somebody's teaching them. Yeah. Okay. okay. Interesting. Or how do little kids learn stuff? Do you think? Little kids learn by other kids. Like they, Mm, that's true. Like, do you think they learn? Do, something. do you think they learn as much from kids as they do from adults? Or yeah. What do you think? What do you guys do? You agree with that? That little kids learn. Uh, I've always been taught that. Like, no. I've always like oh. visualized that people always do what they like. Um, like what their parents or like older siblings do. Yeah. And so they like really cool. So like they learn by watching what other people are doing. They're like a sponge. They observe everything that other people do. Mm. So when adults watched this movie, we showed it to 150 adults. They were like, oh, these kids are so smart. They're so amazing. They like, wow, they have such great conversation with each other. Their vocabulary is amazing. They said that all the time. They talked about your very large and sophisticated vocabulary, all of you. So when you were editing all the good stuff, they did that. No, I didn't actually. I just put in stuff you did on a normal day. Okay, but now I got to tell you the crazy part. Are you ready? The crazy part is we showed it to a hundred first graders. So you guys were in first grade, right? Oh boy. So we showed it to a hundred first graders in lots of different cities in Texas, and they all said the same thing. Are you ready for this? Can you guess negative? what they said? Is it negative? That's cool. <laughs> this is what they said. Asking for hints. Wow, they're smart. We don't do that? No. They said they didn't do I mean, that. They didn't do school that way. But listen class. to this. This is what they said. Yes. They said that you were very loud <laughs> and true. that you were all misbehaving <laughs> and that you weren't learning anything because you weren't listening to your teacher. Like you were talking to each other and That's you weren't, stuff. You, like they said that, <laughs> like the part where you get up helps you figure out where the 21 is. They said that you needed to sit down and you needed to raise your hand. <laughs> but it's, I don't feel like it's, it's like, it's not, it's messed up that. Not not their response, their, but also their response. Like the fact that they're so saying that the fact that they think because we're acting, we were acting, we're misbehaving and not or like not smart because of that. Because it's a high, more efficient way of learning. It's sad to see that they're trained pretty much to do whatever the teacher says and not do it any mm -hmm. comprehending of it. Not like exploring. Because I'm pretty sure like we did learn, but then they would let us. They did. They had patience with us and tell us like. Yes, you can do this. Yes, you can do that. Give us more options than just like, sit down and learn. Mm, yeah, I think I think you're right. But they they what do you like? If they were here, what would you say to them back? I would say it's that we got the opportunity. You two, yes. in line to learn more, more in more ways than one. Yeah. More freedom to not yeah. do whatever we wanted. Because it's good yeah. to have a variety of ways of yeah. learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if you just learn one way then you're not really getting the full spectrum of ways that you can learn. I just counter whatever they said. They're like, you're too misbehaved, you're too behaved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I know one thing that was really cool. 
I don't know if you guys remember that you could do all of these things when you were that little. Like, I saw like a lot of problem solving, like people working together, and so much learning that had nothing to do with me. So, um, while Jen and I were writing the book, we wonder about you guys so much. And I think that's the, the reason why we wanted to do this interview to find out and learn from all of you. So this is kind of like um, my last question for, for panelists today. And so now you guys are older, right? You've been through many schooling in terms of teachers, classes, different teachers, different ways of learning and different ways to be taught. And in this school, we have um, people who are adults who work, they're teachers, they're principals, they're educators. So what would you like them to know about how children learn, like to learn? Or how do you guys think children learn best in your experience? Um, can I go first? Sure, go yeah. ahead. Yes. Okay. I feel like kids learn best whenever you let them like learn in like the way that's easiest for them. Like there's like learners who are visual, there's learners who are more like hands-on. There's there's just like a bunch of different types of learners. And I feel like whenever you let a child like learn in the way that they learn best, that's like I don't know, it just it's better for them and makes the learning experience more positive and just like integrated, like integrated learning where you have everyone together, you know. So they don't, I don't know, just so they're used to different types of people. And so they don't grow up like, I don't know. That's all, I guess. Thank you. Um, I would just add on to what um, Stacy was saying. I totally agree that like being hands-on is definitely the way to um, teach. Um, I feel like, when it's just like pen and paper or when it's straight, like when you're learning everything from a computer, it's gonna take, it's like more difficult to grasp the concept. But I feel like when you're hands-on, like you really, you can remember it more because it's an experience and not like a, like a moment in time, if that makes sense. Oh well, yeah, thank you. What do you see, Jeremiah? Mm -hmm. How children learn best? Uh, I think it just takes time to get to the point. Everyone is different, and there are some ways that boys the same, but it just depends on how that, that child and students um, get to take time and connect them and bond with them. And just keep me there. Okay. Thank you. I, I think that. Um, the epilogue is a section where you really, um, all of you are voicing this, and it's probably the best part of the book, in my opinion. <laughs> I mean, we wrote a lot, but it's just so insightful um, coming from, from all of you. Um, so that's what we wanted to show a little uh, clip so everybody can kind of remind of that. Jane, have one more question for you guys. I do. So um, when in the when we all saw each other when you were in seventh grade in that video, I asked you what you want to do with your career, what you hope to do um, as you as you become an adult, what you want to work in, and wondered if you could each share what you're really interested in and what you see yourself doing um, for your career. Does anybody want to go first? Um, okay, so um, I actually had a lot of things I wanted to be, but I feel like now I have a more clear idea. Um, and I, I feel like I want to be like a nurse, but not like the nurses that stay like, they're like traveling nurses, I forgot the name, but it's like basically, you go to places that need nurses, and you can help people out over there. Um, I don't know, I just think medical stuff is really interesting. And that's what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah, that's great. Tina or Jeremiah? Um, for myself, I used to want to be in the medical field, but my plan after high school, um, as of right now, I do want to join the military. 
um, most likely the Navy or the Army. And after the military, possibly do APD or something with policing, uh, maybe become a peace officer at a school. I want to do that also. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Great, Dina. Jeremiah, how about you? Um, with Latin Smith, I said I want to be a student. Um, but I would probably want to do some stuff for theater, um, like technician wise after, after the military. Cause, um, right now I've, I've grown like to know a lot of new skills and kind of love doing a lot of new things. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. And, um, thanks again for, there's so much that we have learned from you and I hope that you're um, your families are really proud of you and it's just amazing to see how you've grown and gotten more and more confident and um, just can't tell you how much we appreciate you um, being here but also being part of that study so long ago. Um, with that, I think we'll um, turn it over for questions. Um, Maybe in the chat, as we're doing questions, please share anything that you learned from um, what the students said. That's a way of, of paying them back for being here. Sharing what you learned from them, I think, would make a big difference. So please put in the chat something that really stood out from what they shared. Um, I'd appreciate that. I think it's worth noting that what they said in the epilogue in the video you saw and what they're saying now is very, very different from the hundred children we interviewed in the study who thought that learning was supposed to be silent, still, and obedient. Um, just one year of having Miss Jones can make a significant difference in students' lives. So if you are that teacher, you are the one teacher trying to really um, offer agentic experiences, a lot of hands-on learning. They may not have that forever, but it really does make a difference. And um, we can see that even in our data in a, in a very significant way. Um, and I really like, Dina, what you said about how so many different um, racial groups were together in your classroom, but everyone really got along and it really, it really was like a community. And I think that's something that we saw too. Um, okay, so I don't know if Dr. Barasa, this is you, but I can go to the Q&A. Um, but thank you for putting all these comments. Hopefully, um, Dina and Stacy and Jeremiah, you can see all of the things that people have learned from listening to you. Um, so yes, uh, so to the authors, and I've got a couple of questions in the Q&A, but one of them is they want a, a definition of agency. And as the closing of the book comes, by, comes to an end, uh, a, a, a definition for agency and how, they, how you view it in the classroom and how people can talk about it, that was one of the questions. Sure, I can take that. Um, agency is the ability to influence and make decisions about how you learn something or what you learn in order to expand your capabilities. So the end result of being able to do lots of things that um, where you use your agency is that you actually expand a much broader range of capabilities. If you think of the difference between the reflexes and all of the learning about the human body hands-on versus a worksheet. That's, a, that's one way that you can really see the difference where that agency makes. Um, we also, I think it's important to note that the children don't have equal access to using their agency at school and that in our study, it really was, um, it, it depended a lot on um, deficit thinking, if you had deficit thinking about children or their families, racially, linguistically, culturally, you did not offer children agency. And uh, we think that's wrong. So that's a lot of what the book's about. And is, anything you want to add, Kiyomi? And I think that through the having the opportunity to enact your agency allow you to see a lot of capabilities. So when we think about 
just having like a what can we see in a child doing and think about all this stuff throughout the books and examples by allowing that and how amazing the children were because of that too. Uh, Dr. Colgrove, here's another question about how can parents learn from this research because this is coming from a parent educator. How can parents learn? Uh, so one of the um, most important parts and in my part of the work was actually the interview of the family. So as a teacher, when I was a teacher, I was a preschool teacher, bilingual teacher. One, one of the things that I thought was giving a lot of opportunities for parents to participate, communicate, um, and kind of uh, have opportunities to seek their expertise for their children. So I think one of the things that I would like uh, for people to read or think about is how when we want to build community, when we want to build relationship with the families, how much we can learn and that how can impact what we do in the classroom, but also the sense of community that we want to have um, with them throughout the, the interviews. We, we, and, uh, we and have data about, but while Jen was interviewing the children, I was interviewing the parents. And so how important is to invite parents to, to see what's going on in the school, uh, to seek their expertise. In my case, many parents are immigrant parents. They didn't go to school in the US, so they don't know how classroom looks like. So what about inviting parents to come and see the, the school, the classroom, and how children are learning? Uh, so that makes me, that kind of made me think of. I would add too that I think as parents, um, parents can advocate to share their expertise in the classroom. I think parents going to classroom and sharing some of their knowledge and teachers making space for parents to come in and help with projects, to do a survey of, of what parents are interested in and what they like to do. Maybe they're photographers, maybe they're carpenters, maybe they are nurses, whatever expertise they can bring in to working with different projects so that parents can contribute not just cupcakes and treats <laughs> for parties, but they actually contribute to content and curriculum. Um, and I think that's something that parents can really um, feel more confident doing. I also think it's really important for parents to know that there are kids who get to have this kind of learning. And if they don't see it in their schools, that's something they can advocate for. Thank you, Dr. Dare. And, and I know quickly, we have I wanna I wanna add something quickly, quickly, quickly. Uh, the project that you got to see a Stacy with a volcano, that wasn't part of like an assignment uh, Ms. Jones gave them. Actually, that was something Stacy came up and how the parents supported that volcano uh, design that she brought with them. So there's many ways in which families are uh, participating and working with their children. No, thank you, Dr. Colgrove. I want to make sure because people are asking where can they follow your work if and as we are wrapping up, if you want to share a link, but also through high school, we'll make sure um, all of these from the from this book, The Segregation by Experience, we have recorded all the different sessions and they're also in our YouTube channel through High Scope. It was, it's very important for High Scope to support work that really is um, bringing a different lens to the early childhood field. We want to thank you for joining us for the last, uh, I believe, eight months. It's been an honor to have you uh, be part of our roundtable. We are excited to continue selling your book in our, um, in our store for highscope.org. Please reach out. And um, to all our, our participants, we want to thank you for joining us. We want to make sure that you're aware that you will receive a certificate within 24 hours and that once again, that you can purchase the book in our, in our store. And we will also be able to uh, have the recordings available to you, which is very, it's, we've had great participation from a lot of people throughout these months. And also we want to encourage you that Time is running out to register for HighScope's 50th International Conference. This is a hybrid conference that from May 11th through the 13th in Detroit with in-person and virtual sessions. We encourage you to please join us. And on behalf of the HighScope Educational Research Foundation, we wanna thank you very much for joining us this afternoon.